Hi, I'm here in Bristol, just outside the offices of Icon Films, the third fastest growing indie outside the M25. Now I'm here to see a screening of River Monsters 3D, a special one-off episode that was broadcast on Freenet in the States back in April. Now I'm going to be doing a little bit of a behind-the-scenes feature of this, including interviews with Thomas Calpe, who was featured in Broadcast Magazine's latest Hot Shots in 2010. He was Icon's 3D workflow consultant on the show. We'll also be talking to Barney Revel, the director of the series, including the special 3D edition. And of course we'll be talking to Jeremy Wade, who is the biologist and extreme angler and the frontman of the hit show. Well first of all, let's have a quick look at a sneak preview of River Monsters 3D, Pack of Teeth. In southern Africa, there are rumours of a deadly fish. It lurks unseen in the eerie waters of the Okavango Delta. There are large animals under the water making these really shake. A killer with shark-like teeth. There are stories of it hunting in packs. There are killing machines. Feeding in frenzies on schooling fish. This is just incredible. And even on drowning humans. It's the most brutal thing you'll ever witness. It sounds like the work of giant South American piranhas. But there's nothing like that here in Africa. Or is there? My name is Jeremy Wade. Fish on! And my mission is to enter this mysterious world. To track down and catch this murderous river monster. I'm now here with Campbell Goodwill from Edition. You're the stereoscopic supervisor on the show. Tell me, what equipment were you using? Because it all looked pretty handheld and pretty frenetic. Yeah, so uh, the main system was uh, based on SI2Ks, um, it's the SI3D system, um, using Canon lenses uh, and a pulsar rig. Um, and that was the bulk of our filming was done on that. Brendan, I mean, the, the, the main rig uh, weighed um, just under 20 kilos. Um, so he's uh, shooting that with a with an easy rig, has a, a bar that comes over the top. Yeah, that supports the camera. So that 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 gave the was able to give him the, the, the handheld feel without compromising the the the, the, the sort of run and gun um, the, the aesthetic of the show. Um, now we then were um, had a had a sort of umbilical from the cameras to. Um, my unit, which uh, was a backpack mounted unit, um, we had a custom built recording system that I built, um, and that, that allowed me to have a, a screen in front of my face the whole time with touchscreen controls of, of, of all the 3D. The helicopter shots were fantastic. Just heard then that you had to be quite innovative. You had it for a few hours, didn't you? And, yeah. How did you maximise those couple of hours of time? Yeah, so we've done we've done a fair bit of helicopter, uh, 3D helicopter filming before, and, and uh, so we knew what what sort of interaxials we'd need. I, I had I had a, a, a box in, um, built around my screen um, to just protect it from the glare of the of the African African sun. So uh, I had my head buried in a box. I didn't have the box around my head, unfortunately. <laughs> Actually, what I think I'm most sort of proud of is the fact that the whole film works as a film. It's not just a 3D spectacle, if you know what I mean. Like, I think a lot of 3D productions um, get, caught, get overly caught up in the 3D mechanics and the sort of the technicalities. And what I think I'm most proud about in this 3D film is the fact that it's still a great film. It's still a River Monsters through and through. It's, it's got the pace, it's got the energy. We haven't compromised it because it's 3D it's not suddenly gone from being an exciting series to being a very static tripod you know sort of all these things you get warned about with 3D that you can't do this you can't do that and and what we have actually managed to achieve is you know a, a sort of good action packed thriller of a film as per usual but with the added sort of extra um, sort of value uh, dare I say it, dimension of having of it being in 3D which I think adds a lot to it it's everything that you get in a normal uh, River Monsters, but with you know with the extra dimension. So, um, I mean, how to how to explain how to summarise River Monsters? I mean, it, it it is sort of in a genre of its own. A lot of people assume it's a fishing program. It's not really. Fishing is a means to an end. That is because generally we're working in in water where you haven't got visibility. The only way to find out what's in there is to put a, a line in. Normally, we start with a story. Um, it's, it's a fisherman's tale, it's something that sounds a bit unlikely, there's no evidence for it apart from maybe um, eyewitnesses telling you what happened. 
And so uh, what I do is I go along and investigate that story. Is it true? Is it false? Or is there something, some creature behind it? So in this case, what it was was um, somewhere in southern Africa there was this story of a ferry, which in, in this case it's just, it's just a, you know, a, a dugout canoe with a, a load of people in that was a little bit unstable, a bit overloaded perhaps. It tipped into the water. Uh, some people drowned, some people had bite marks on them. Now, the people at the time said it looked like, uh, it looked like teeth of, of fish. Uh, I think the official report then said, well, no, it's crocodiles. You know, the obvious thing would be crocodiles. But um, the people originally said, we were, were very certain that it was, that it was fish. Now, it, it sounded a bit like piranhas but maybe on a slightly bigger scale. Think about Southern Africa or, you know, Africa generally, you know, there aren't piranhas there. They're, they're on the other side of the world. So is there, is there anything in that part of the world that could feed in a piranha-type fashion? So that is the story that I investigate. The beauty of this is that unlike many of the other shows where we get maybe one chance with one massive fish that after maybe a week of trying, Jeremy pulls in, with the Tigerfish show, we knew that it's essentially it's a pack hunting animal and so the chances are we would be able to find it and he would be able to catch it of course a lot relies on him and his expertise which he's amazing at but I think that was also part of the decision to shoot this one in 3D of all the ones in this season is that we knew we'd have more than one chance with this fish it wouldn't just be a one we've got it for like five minutes and then what do you mean it like the stereo was all messed up and we can't use it you know we knew that we'd probably have a few chances uh, we ended up cutting in Avid um, 5.5, so before version 6, which had really good support, or has really good support for 3D workflows. We ended up with burnt in side by side footage being created through our online support guys, at, well, offline support guys at Films 59. Um, and that worked quite well, but it meant that we didn't have any opportunity to, to fix the 3D problems that inevitably you come across. So um, I got the guys to create some preset filter effects for sort of percentage parallax corrections on vertical axes as well as um, being able to set the depths and convergence just for the offline viewings because we didn't want to cause any pain to the American execs who hadn't been watching that much 3D because it wasn't exec by a 3D channel. The thing is, just doing river monsters in 2D is, is, is a challenge because you're dealing with fish, they're wild animals, Fishing is something that normally I do on my own. Filming it, you've suddenly got an entourage of four people and all their kit. When that becomes 3D, that's multiplied to, what, seven or eight people and more kit, all connected together with pieces of wire. So you're, you know, the, the, the thing about fishing is you're, you're having to be mobile but also stealthy. And you know, the fact that you've just doubled the size of your crew almost makes that harder. It's more of a challenge. Uh, the thing that was quite a surprise, though, was that it didn't slow it down or it didn't change it as much as I expected or as much as anybody else expected, I think. And I, I think partly that's because um, we chose our location and our subject very well. I think some, some of that was, was intentional. Some of it was sort of luck playing into our hands. Um, we had... Uh, some of, some of the shoots we actually change location, we change our base every, every other day perhaps on average. On this particular one we just had two bases. We were on a houseboat for one and then we were you know, in, a, in a camp. My big thing which I found, which I sort of learned from I think, was that as the director in a 3D shoot you're one of the only people that's not really thinking about the 3D. I mean, don't get me wrong, you're thinking about the 3D but it's not your sole focus. Your focus is the story, the film, the narrative arc, the you know the big product. It's not just a 3D showcase. It's got to work as a movie, as a documentary, as a film. And so I quite often found myself being the only person going, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, let's not forget, we've got to make a story here. And so it, at all times you're trying to maximise the 3D. You're trying to make it work. But you're also... We got to really... I, I, took a, I really sort of tried to make myself be like, no, hang on, guys... We've got to make this work as a film. It's got to. We've got to have that character, and so inevitably there'll be moments where maybe it's not the best 3D shot in the world, but you need that because you've got a story to tell. You've got to get from A to B to C. You've got to get Jeremy to, you know, do his thing, and and so 
that for me was whenever other directors are asking me, so what was it like to shoot a 3D film? I'm like, just, you know, yes, in, absorb yourself within the world of 3D because it's fascinating. And, and I think if you do that, you can learn how to use it and really sort of push it. But never lose sight of the fact that you're making a film. You're making a story and you've got, you're the only one really that's left in charge of that. We, were, we actually very successfully um, made our own conversions. So some of the underwater thrashing, when it's just white water and black, we would take that from a 2D film, because we've got loads of previous archive River Monsters programs that we've done, and we'd take the best bubbles and we would suck the whites out into the foreground and have the blacks out in depth and have all the greys in the middle on the screen plane. And so the thrashing around that you get with the bubbles underwater, that, that's 2D shots um, that we just borrowed and, and sort of stretched out. And again, we did that in the offline and it worked. So for a lot of things that you're filming, you know, you can do another take, another take, but when you've actually got the fish, you know, the, 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 the main thing in the programme, you've really, it, it's pressure on everybody because, you know, the crew has got to get their filming right first time. If I'm saying anything to the camera, you know, basically I've just got one shot at it. Um, I mean, we do sometimes employ a little bit of trickery there. We can sort of, we can do a two shot of me plus fish, then we'll do close ups of the fish. And then what we might do is put the fish back and then do just close ups on my face, talking as if I'm still holding the fish, which we can then sort of cut between. That, you know, that, that works quite well. It's, you know, it's a little bit of sort of trickery, but I'm quite, I'm happy with that because it is all about the, the fish welfare. While we were shooting, we were always aiming for around 3%. I mean, Campbell was always aiming for around 3% our stereographer. Um, but inevitably, in sort of run and gun shoot mode that we were in, and with some of our second cameras that we had, we, we, had, we ended up with some shots that were up to 5 or 6%. Um, some of those made it in. Some of those got through um, all the way to the US version. I, don't, I haven't seen whether they've made it into the sky, the sort of sky friendly version yet. When we came to the online and we were doing the depth grades, we tended to avoid, we went for a sort of sky style, which was not as out in your face and more, um, you know, avoiding any window edge violations, things like that. What I, interestingly, I took it to the States, to Discovery Center, and delivered it by hand there. And while I was there, I was able to sit in on their 3D depth check review and I sat with a guy who just re-depth graded two thirds of the film to bring everything out because he, you know, he's used to receiving things that are, are done for Sky and, and then the Americans, they're not too fussed about edge violations. They just want everything out, slapping you in the face wherever possible. You kind of want that authenticity. Often we use the people who told their own story, you know, so something that happened to them, they were attacked, we get them to help out with their reenactments, but it actually helps because they were there, they know what it was like, they can reenact that moment. Um, but yeah, we don't have the budgets to fly uh, equity members from London over to do it for us. So. It's about jumping back and forwards in Z space whilst you're doing these cuts. So what I found was that a lot of our reconstruction stuff that we did underwater, we were able to have the sort of action relatively on the screen plane without that much behind it or in front of it. So you can quick cut that absolutely fine and keep it all around the same area of depth, and that's not a problem. Um, and then I would look for other similar depth shots where the main um, convergence point wasn't going to be jumping back or forward too much, you know, so things weren't coming out of the screen and your eyes are reconverging out here and then jumping back. As long as your eyes aren't working too hard back and forward, then it's practically a 2D show that you're watching really quickly because your eyes are converged always on the main point of interest. People assume that the, you know, the, the dangerous thing is going to be the fish. Now the thing is the fish um, we, we research thoroughly and also I'm completely focused when I'm, when I'm handling it or as focused as I can be with a, you know, maybe a cameraman director talking to me. It's those random things out of the environment, which are the ones that, that can catch you unawares. We had our, our sound recorders was hit by lightning a couple of years ago, and that just came out out of nowhere. But it's, you know, otherwise it's things like, uh, you know, it's things like driving on, on some of these roads. You know, that, that is probably where you've got to be more careful than, than actually dealing in a, in, a, in a comparatively controlled situation with an animal that you, you, know, you, you actually know about and you've thoroughly researched. We, we went in quite conservative to begin with and then kept sort of adding 
to it as we went along. Um, kept building up and building up and we were always thinking we would have to have a separate 2D version and we'd have to recut it for 2D. Um, and as we got more and more and more into this quick style of, of cutting in 3D, we, we started to realise actually that the 2D recut, which we'd put a couple of weeks aside for, was probably not going to be that substantial at all. Um, and in the end it was pretty much, you know, the 2D version is a bit shorter and the execs asked for a couple of things in that that she wasn't as fussed about in the 3D version. You, if you're showing an unfamiliar a uh, animal, uh, 3D does really give you um, possibly a, you know, a better sense of what that creature is like. So yes, this was my first 3D project and, and I loved it. Um, it's very much in its infancy as a sort of a, a medium and I think it's just going to get better and better and easier and easier. But I think it's got real potential. Uh, it really does. I mean, I think you need to choose your subject matter very carefully, you know. Um, but the fact that we're shooting essentially a sort of a handheld run around documentary, you know, with a presenter adventurous in an exotic location in 3D is, is I think, you know, something that not many people have done. And I think it's going to be the way forward. I don't think. You know, I don't think we'll just be turning on the TV to watch it in 3D, but I think if you want to watch something, an event moment, a big documentary or a series that you love, people are doing it.